we are in the middle of a uh, longer essay. I, we had a, uh, had one of those mornings where everything seems to go wrong. There's lots of malfunctions today with the weather and uh, our copier machine was not working today, but I managed to miraculously get out just a few copies of our handout today. Um, I don't have any spare copies of the actual text, so I, but I see everyone has, oh, oh no, if you don't have a copy of the actual text, you may want to share with a friend. Miriam and Sherry maybe want to share with each other. There you go. Okay. I'd like to review where we are up to today in the Morin of Uchim. We are, we, first of all, we are broadcasting from the Web Yeshiva Facebook page, um, and um, we are using the Shlomo Pines edition of the Morin of Uchim in the English translation, published by the University of Chicago Press. Um, and uh, we are uh, in the 21st chapter of the first section of Moran Nevuchim, which if you'd like to, uh, and we are on page 50 of the actual text. Now, we are, the reason why we are in the middle of this chapter is because it was, <coughs> it was a longer than normal chapter from what we're used to encountering at the beginning of Moran Nevuchim. And what we had seen is that the, the undertaking of this chapter is to really focus on the idea of the experience that Moshe Rabbeinu had after the sin of the golden calf, where God places him in the cleft of a rock, places his palm, his anthropomorphic palm, over Moshe Rabbeinu so that Moshe is protected, and God passes his face over Moshe. Vayavor Hashem al panav. And God says, you will, you will not see my face, but you will only see my back. The Rambam was, is disturbed by this very anthropomorphic term, la'avor, to pass over, because God, is, has been the premise throughout this book, does not have any spatial confinement, because he's not limited to any physical confinements. And therefore, to say that God passed over Moshe on, in a spatial way is not a reasonable translation. It, it defies an understanding, a true understanding of Hashem who does not occupy any physical space. And therefore, the Rambam had told us at the beginning of this chapter, and you have this in your handout, and by the way, the handout is available for anyone who's watching on Facebook. You can go to the Facebook group Shi'ur in Moren Nevuchim, and you can easily download the handout in its in JPEG format. The Rambam had told us that there are five meanings of the word avar, ayin bet resh, that appear throughout Tanakh. The first and simplest and the primary use of it is a physical body passing in front of another body. Okay, so hu avar lifnehem, that Yaakov passes in front of his family in order to appear before Asa first. That's the simplest explanation. Explanation number two is like vaya'aviru kol bamachaneh, they reverberated a voice or a sound throughout the camp. So lahavir kol means to cause a sound to reverberate and to echo outward. Okay, that's the second definition. The third definition is when a person has a prophetic vision of the Shekhinah in his mind, he can see a vision of the Shekhinah passing prophetically. And this is the description that he attributes to the Brit Bein HaBitarim, the covenant of the cut parts that God made with our patriarch Avraham, in that the Rambam demonstrates, at least this is his way of understanding the narrative in the Torah in Genesis, that the entire vision that Avraham has of God passing in front of him uh, in, in the divine presence, passing in between these cut pieces of animal parts in making a covenant is all a vision of prophecy. It didn't actually happen on a physical plane. So therefore, when it says um, that God passed, that God was avar, bein hagizarim, between the parts, it means within Avraham's vision. But it's not a spatial, physical passing. That was definition number three. Definition number four, he quoted from a Pusik in Yirmi and the prophet Jeremiah, that a person who drinks too much the uh, verb avar applies to that person. So doing something to excess, 
can be used, can be, uh, can utilize the verb avar. And the fifth one, which is what he's really focusing on, the Rambam, is, to cre- is that the word avar or laha avir, as it's conjugated, is to create a diversion. And that was the story of Jonathan and David, where Jonathan was with his squire, his ward, and he didn't want that squire to know that he was sending a message, a covert message to King David with the shooting of the arrows. But with the shooting of the arrows, the message to King David was, is that you are in danger from thy father, you need to flee. And that was the, why the scripture uses the term laha'aviro to deceive or to divert the squire from discovering the true import of the shooting of the arrows and was to divert him to think that he was just shooting arrows for sport, okay? And the Rambam says, if you take that last definition of what, it, of what Ayin Bet Resh means, then when you look at the story of, uh, of the encounter between God and Moses after the golden calf, and it says, Vaya'avor Hashem al-panav vayikra, that God was over al-panav, it means that God diverted Moshe from seeing his face, from seeing God's face. That's the diversion that God created. And what is the diversion that God created? We're not exactly sure, but God had told Moshe, Vira'ita et achorai ufanai lo yera'u, you can only see my back. You will, no human being has the ability to see my face. But even seeing my back is a unique experience that will only be provided to you, Moshe Rabbeinu, by virtue of your greatness in prophecy and because you are the leader, you are the lawgiver, and therefore you will see that which no other man has or will ever see of me, which is my back. The Rambam explained that this idea of seeing, not seeing my face but seeing my back is that no human being is capable of understanding God's true essence because the human mind simply is limited and, and it doesn't have the capacity to process ideas that are beyond human comprehension. Godliness in his true essence is not comprehensible to man. How does man comprehend God? Through his manifestations in this world. God chooses to appear to mankind in certain ways through his interactions with our three-dimensional uh, world. And that's what achorai means. You will see my back. That is, my ver- you will see my various attributes in, with the greatest level of clarity that any human being is capable of seeing. Okay? So that's where we are up until now. With the Rambam had also told us that when the Torah says, quite anthropomorphically, that God says, uh, the sakosiet the kapi olecha ad ovri, I will place my palm upon the cleft of the rock until I pass over so that you don't see my face. What that palm is actually referring to is God providing divine protection to Moshe's intellect to prevent Moshe's intellect from a rupture, from damage. Because as the Rambam says that he will explain in a later chapter, and he refers here now to chapter 34 that of, this, of, this, uh, of this section, uh, I think it's chapter, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 32, the Rambam says, I will explain later on in chapter 32 that if a person attempts to comprehend an aspect of godliness that is beyond human comprehension, the person could potentially perish or be seriously damaged intellectually. Now, where do we know this from? The four. four, four, four exactly. Very good. So it's from the story of the four who entered into the Pardes, the, the Gemara the, the often quoted story from the Gemara in Masechet Chagiga Yudalad on the Bet 14b, where the Talmud tells us that four entered into the Pardes, four entered into philosophical <coughs> speculation, and Ve'eluhain, and they are as follows Ben Azai, Ben Zoma, Acher, and Rebbe Akiva. This is the story that we'll, we'll see that the Rambam is going to come back to multiple times, just like one of the central stories of of Moranavuchim is the visibility or the, the comprehensibility of the Almighty. And what the Rambam understands in this story is that these four rabbis uh, endeavored to enter into an area of divine speculation that was really on the edge 
of human accessibility. And as a matter of fact, Rabbi Akiva warned them that there are going to be certain things that you may see that you will misunderstand and make sure that you don't get injured, meaning this whole idea of if you try to trespass beyond human comprehension, your mind can get damaged. Make sure you don't get damaged. And the Gemara tells us that the Ben Azai Hetzitz Vamet, that Ben Azai gazed and died. And so according to this understanding, it means that he went a little bit too far in his attempt to intellectualize and comprehend God. And Ben Zoma Hetzitz Vinifga, Ben Zoma gazed and was injured, which means that he went insane. Um, and uh, Rabbi Akiva, uh, Acher was the one who became a heretic because he misunderstood what he was seeing, because his mind was not capable of truly comprehending what he was, what he was experiencing. And Rabbi Akiva was the only one who entered and left in peace, meaning that he knew his limitations and he did not trespass beyond what was humanly comprehensible in that philosophical or spiritual endeavor, which we're going to get into later on. Now, all of this is according to the Rambam's understanding that when it says, Vaya'avor Hashem al Panav, that God was over his Panav, what it means is he created a diversion to prevent Moshe from seeing his true face. But now he's going to present us with an alternate translation of the words, Vaya'avor Hashem al Panav. And he's about to tell us that this translation that I'm about to present you with, instead of being something that is unacceptable, is quite acceptable. And let's take a look. He's now going to tell us that if we take a look at Onkelos's translation, that is equally as acceptable as what I have told you as well. So the Aramaic translation, we are on page 49 now. I'm sorry. The Aramaic translation of the Bible. It's about, if you want to see uh, on page 49, it's about um, maybe... 15 or 16 lines down. The Aramaic translation of the Bible, when rendering this verse, does what it customarily does in similar cases. For in every case in which it finds that, that a thing is ascribed to God, to which the doctrine of corporeality or some concomitants of this doctrine are attached, <clears throat> now get ready for some fancy words which we won't understand. It assumes that the nomen regions has been omitted and considers that the ascription concerns something expressed by a term that is the nomen regions of the genitive God and that has been omitted. Let me explain to you in simple English what is being stated. The word nomen regions is a fancy um, uh, linguistic term. What it means is, is that if you have a two noun word that is descriptive of an object, sometimes you can omit the first word and use the second word just as shorthand. That's what it means. And therefore, what Uncleus, Uncleus has a tradition in when he translates the Torah from Hebrew to Aramaic. And sometimes he will understand that when the Torah says the word Hashem, what it really means is the blank of Hashem, which is some aspect or creation that God made to represent himself on a physical plane, but is not God himself. And therefore, Uncleus says that when the Torah says, Vaya'avor Hashem al Panav, it doesn't mean that God himself, in his essence, passed over Moshe, because that, of course, is impossible, as the Rambam has just got through explaining to us. But rather, what it means is, is that some manifestation of God that God created to be on a physical plane passed in front of Moshe. And the Rambam says that's perfectly a legitimate explanation. But let's show you some examples of where Uncleus does this. Thus, when scripture says, Vihinei Hashem nitzav alav vayomar, that when God, when the, 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 we're going to read in this week's Parsha, we just read it in this morning's Torah reading, that uh, in Parsha's Vayetze, Jacob has an image of a dream, of a ladder in his dream. And uh, what does it say? It says that God was standing on the top of the ladder. Now, the Uncleus, if you take a look, it says, doesn't say, Vaha Hashem ma'ateid alavohe in Aramaic. It doesn't say that God was standing up over him, but it rather says, Vaha yikarad Hashem ma'ateid alavohe. That it says that, that the glory of God was standing over him on the top of the ladder. 
And the reason why the Rambam explains it this way is because it is not appropriate to suggest that God occupies a specific space on top of the ladder. And that's the way Uncleus explains. Even though, it, even though the Torah says that God was standing, it means the glory of God. Some representation that a prophet can cognize, but is not God himself. Another example that he says that where this takes place um, uh, is that uh, um, when scripture says, the Lord watch be between me and thee, which is what Lavan, again, in this week's Parsha, says to uh, his son-in-law, Yaakov, it says, Yitzef Hashem Beini Uveinecha. May God stand or, or, or use this as a safeguard between you and me. And he doesn't mean God himself to act as a barrier between you and me, but rather Memra Dashem. Uncleus translates it as the word of God, meaning the covenant that we have just made will act as a sort of a barrier or protection between you and me so that we don't harm each other. And so again, you sometimes see that the word Hashem or God is used in the Torah and it doesn't mean God himself in his essence but rather the something of God okay so this occurs throughout the translation of Uncleus peace be upon him he does the same thing with regard to the dictum of the strip scripture vayavor Hashem al panav that God passed before his face which he translates and you have this in source number four on your sheet vaavar Hashem shechinte al apohe that God passed his Shekhinah, his divine presence, over Moshe's face. So the way that Rambam translated Vayavor Hashem al Panav is that God diverted his face from Moshe, meaning God's face. But Uncleus says, no, God passed over Moshe's face. So he says the word Panav means Moshe's face, but it doesn't mean that God in his essence spatially passed over Moshe's face, but rather God's Shekhinah his divine presence or his manifestation in this world of himself passed over Moshe. Thus, according to him, undoubtedly it was a created thing that passed by. He considers that in the expression his face, the possessive suffix in the third person referring to Moshe, as we just said. The interpretation of before his face would accordingly be in his presence, as when scripture says, so the present passed before his face. So, it's no different, therefore, from the spatially passing that the Rambam has said is the first definition of passing in front of. This, too, says the Rambam, is an excellent interpretation that may be approved of. And I have no problem. If you want to explain and translate the Pasuk this way, differently from the way I translated it, but the way that Uncleus translates it, more power to you. He says, perfectly fine. A corroboration, now we're on page 50, of the interpretation of Uncleus, may his memory be blessed, may be found in the dictum of scripture, and, that sh and it shall come to pass while my glory passes by, which is in that story itself, the haya ba'avor kivodi, that when my glory passes by you, Moshe, I will place you in the cleft of the rock, and you will therefore only get a chance, I will place my palm over you as my glory passes by, and then I will remove my palm so that you will only see my back and you will not see my face. This verse makes it clear that what passes is a thing related to God, may he be exalted, but not the essence of God, may his name be sublime. And it is thus of this glory that scripture says, until I have passed by, and vayavor Hashem al panav, that God passed by before his face. It is necessary to assume an omitted nomen, nomen regions, as is always done by Uncleus, for in accord with the context, sometimes he takes the omitted word to be kavod, glory, sometimes he takes it to be shechina, and sometimes he takes it to be the memra dashem, the word of God. Um, and for our part two, here, and now the Rambam gives us a slightly alternate explanation, sort of branching away from Uncleus, but saying, here's with the way I would like to explain it. Instead of my explaining it as the Shekhinah of God passing in front of Moshe, my preference, if I'm going to use Uncleus's methodology, that it's a manifestation that is created by God that passes over Moshe's face, I would rather say that the word Hashem does not refer to his Shekhinah, but I would rather say it refers to the voice of God, meaning as follows. And the voice of the Lord passed by before him and called, Vayavor Hashem al panav, Vayikra, that in other words, instead of saying the Shekhinah of God passed before Moshe, 
say it was the call of God, the voice of God passed before Moshe and called out. Now, why does the Rambam prefer this? He doesn't really explain yet, but let's see, maybe we'll get to the essence of why he explains it this way. We've already explained that the Hebrew language was, uh, uses the word passing in a figurative sense with reference to voice. That's, that was the second definition, a sound reverberating outwards as you have on the top of your sheet. In the verse in question, it would be the voice that called. You should, so you should not consider it as improbable that a, a call is ascribed to a voice, for it is in these very words that expression is given to the fact that God may be exalted spoke to Moshe. Right? Basically, he's saying that it fits in because what is the voice that calls out to Moshe and teaches him the 13 attributes of mercy, Hashem, Hashem, Kel Rachum, Bechanan? It says, Vayikra, God called out to him. So what is this, what is calling out to Moshe? It is the call, it is the voice of God, okay? For it says, then he heard the voice speaking unto him. And this is, you can find this, that God, that, sometimes manifests himself as a voice calling out to Moshe. Where do we see this? We see this in the book of Numbers, chapter 7, verse 89. It says that when Moshe would come into the tent of meeting, that God would speak with him, and it says that, by Yishma'at HaKol Midaber Elav, that Moshe would hear a voice, and that voice was speaking to him. So if if Therefore, one of the ways that Moshe received divine communication was by hearing a voice. It is therefore not far-fetched to suggest that the words Vaya'avor Hashem al Panav Vayikra, that the voice of God passed over Moshe and called out, the voice itself called out. Not that God called out, because God does not connect on a physical plane, right? But rather the voice of God, that God created some kind of sound that would convert itself into words, and that was the sound that Moshe heard. Just as in this latter verse, speech is ascribed to the voice, a call is attributed to the voice in the verse here we are discussing. Sometimes, I mean, the ascription of speech and of a call to a voice occurs quite explicitly. Thus it says in the book of Isaiah, kol omer kira, a voice of God says, call out, the omar ma ekra. And then Isaiah says, what shall I call out? Right? So according to this assumption, the interpretation of our verse would thus be, a voice from God passed by in his presence and called Hashem, Hashem. The repetition of the word Hashem would be due to its being a call. In other words, basically, if the word Vayikra means that God calls out to someone to get their attention. And every time we find that God calls out, like God says, Vayomer Avraham, Avraham. Vayomer Hine, God says, Avraham, Avraham, and Avraham responds, Here I am. Why then does God's name appear twice? Hashem, Hashem, Kel Rachum Vechanun. It's the same idea to grab someone's attention, to say, I am Hashem, the, the merciful and benevolent God. Okay, so that's the way he explains the doubling of the language, Hashem, Hashem. The repetition of the word Hashem would be due to its being a call for he may be exalted, would be the one who is called. In other words, Hashem is the one who says, if you want to get my attention, this is how you do it. It would be like saying, Moshe, Moshe, Avram, Avraham, this too is a very fine interpretation. Um, in other words, God was essentially teaching Moshe, this is how you get my attention when you're in trouble and you need divine mercy. You say, Hashem, Hashem, that's like, that's what you're going to say. You're going to call out to me. You're going to say, Hashem, Hashem. Now, we're going to finish this chapter at this point with the following words, where the Rambam now says, okay, I've given you so many different ways of understanding this verse. But the Rambam says, don't think that that's a cop-out. Don't think that when there are multiple ways to understand the verse, then there's something lacking. A lot of times when you have multiple explanations of one question, it means that none of the answers are completely satisfactory. So the Rambam wants to dispel that in this last paragraph of this essay. You should not consider as blameworthy the fact that this profound subject, which is remote from our apprehension, should be subject to many different interpretations. For this does no harm with respect to that toward which we direct ourselves. And you are free to choose whatever belief you wish. You may believe 
that the great station attained by Moshe was indubitably in its entirety a vision of prophecy and that he solely desired intellectual, intellectual apprehensions, everything, namely, that which we had demanded, that which, was, that which he had demanded, that which was denied to him, and that which he apprehended, being intellectual and admitting of no recourse to the senses as we had interpreted in the first place. So if you are a pure non-corporealist or an anti-corporealist and you want to distance any kind of physical attribution to God completely as much as possible, and you want to say that this entire uh, narrative of Moshe having this encounter with God after the golden calf in Exodus is completely on an intellectual plane, you're perfectly, uh, you have perfect permission to do so. That's perfectly fine. And that's the first way that I interpreted it. Vayavor Hashem al-Panav means that God created a diversion to prevent <coughs> Moshe from seeing his face. That's one way. Or you may believe that there was, in addition to this intellectual apprehension, an apprehension due to the sense of sight, which, however, had for its object a created thing through seeing which the perfection of intellectual apprehension might be achieved. This would be the interpretation of this passage by Uncleus. So there's also, it's possible that you can say that Uncleus says that God created something visible that Moshe could see passing over him. And that's also possible, that God created some physical manifestation, call it the Shekhinah like Onkelos does, unless one assumes that this ocular apprehension also occurred in the vision of prophecy, as is stated with regard to Avram, behold, a smoking furnace and a flaming torch that passed. So you could also say that even using Onkelos' translation, it all occurred in a prophetic experience like we explained with the Brit Bein of Bitarim, that it didn't happen on a physical plane, but it happened in a prophetic vision, and that's also possible to explain with an onculus. Or again, you may believe that there was an addition and apprehension due to the sense of hearing, that which passed by before his face being the voice, which is likewise indubitably a created thing. You could also take my translation using onculus's methodology and say that it wasn't the Shekhinah of God that was a physically created, a visible manifestation of God, but rather it was an audible manifestation of God that passed before motion. Choose whatever opinion you wish, inasmuch as our only purpose is that you should not believe that when scripture says in the verse we are discussing, vaya avor, that God passed by, the phrase is analogous to pass before the people, meaning that God in his essence is capable of physical confinements to be in one place and then to pass over to another place. For God, may he be honored and magnified, is not a body and it is not permitted to ascribe motion to him. It is therefore impossible that he should have been said to pass by if the word is used in the first meaning given to it in the Hebrew language. And therefore, if you just want to get a synopsis of what the Rambam has just taught us, take a look at the bottom of the handout that I gave you today. And basically, the Rambam has provided us with three, which really are four, definitions of the words vaya'avor Hashem al panav just to review, and this with this will conclude. Definition number one, God diverted Moshe from seeing his true essence. God diverted his face. Okay, that's definition number one. And this is therefore, there's nothing occurring on the physical plane. Moshe's having a completely prophetic experience. There is nothing on the physical plane happening whatsoever. Definition number two of Ayavor Hashem al Panav. God caused his Shekhinah to pass before Moshe. This is the way that Onkelos translates the verse. And it was a visible manifestation of God, and the Rambam therefore breaks that down into two possibilities. It either happened on a physical plane, or the physical vision of God's Shekhinah that Moshe had was, was apprehended prophetically. It was also in his mind. But he sees in his mind the vision of God pass, of the Shekhinah passing before him, just like Yaakov has a dream in the, uh, of God's glory standing at the top of a ladder. So a prophet can have a vision in his mind also of some manifestation of God, or there could actually be a physical manifestation of some created object that God wishes to represent himself in the here and now. Either one is acceptable, he says. And the third interpretation is the Rambam says, I'll take, a, I'll take Unculus's methodology, but instead of saying that it was a 
Shekhinah, a visible manifestation, it was an audible manifestation that Moshe could hear God's voice. Now, why does the Rambam change it from Ankalus? In other words, I understand the first interpretation where he said it's completely non-physical. It's just Vayavor Hashem al Panav means that God diverted his face from Moshe. But here he's saying, but you could also explain that God passed over Moshe's face. That's certainly a viable interpretation. But it doesn't mean that God himself, it doesn't mean that God Shechina, but it means God's voice. It seems that the Rambam is a minimalist and he would very much prefer to never talk about a physical manifestation of God that is visible if it is at all avoidable. Even if it's a differentiation between a, a, a visible manifestation versus an audible manifestation, it, anytime you can become more ethereal in God's um, uh, appearance to man, that is preferred. So the Rambam prefers to say that if anything physical passed before Moshe, it was a voice and it was not a, it was not a visible apparition of the Shekhinah. Because that, he says, even though we know that those physical apparitions have occurred throughout Tanakh, for example, we know it occurs atop of Har Sinai. We know it occurs in the filling of the Shekhinah of a cloud in the Mishkan. But to say that it happened here, it seems like the Rambam would prefer to avoid that. And he feels that because there is a calling out to Moshe anyway of God reciting the 13 attributes of mercy and God has no voice, God has no vocal cords, and therefore it cannot have been God himself who was creating that sound, it therefore stands to reason that Vayavor Hashem al Panav is that the voice that God created or the sound that God created passed in front of Moshe and recited the words Hashem Hashem Kel Racham Vichai. Okay, I hope that's, um, that adds a little bit more dimension to, to what we've been studying. But again, remember, this whole exercise is not linguistics. The purpose of this exercise is not to act as a dictionary to define what the word Laha Avir or Vaya Avor means, but it's rather to make sure that we understand that when the Torah speaks in anthropomorphic terms, we have to carefully break down these, these narratives and make sure that we understand that God himself cannot fill the physical world and occupy space. Okay? That's the approach. Are we all good? Questions, comments? Yes, Mary. So when you talk about you know, uh, uh, getting an intellectual apprehension of God, and, and it, it's in response to his like that's where this is coming in. Are we actually thinking that there's an instantaneous experience that he has that suddenly he knows, as opposed to every other learning which takes years and years and months and months and, and, and time and, and um, investment, is there something sort of miraculous that suddenly, in a second, without his effort? That's, a, that's an excellent question. What we're going to see is that when it comes to what we would call metaphysics or divine science, however you want to call it, there is the responsi a, a responsibility, an onus, a burden that is placed upon the student to work uh, very, very hard in order to be able to develop his intellect to a certain point. But then he gets, attains a certain, a certain threshold through his own efforts, and then he requires some divine schlep to pull him along and to give him that eureka moment, that sort of revel revelatory experience. And that's what prophecy is. For the Rambam, prophecy is an intellectual excellence that has been attained through effort, and we'll get more into this in the Mar Nevuchim, but then at some point you reach that threshold of hard work that, that the hard work has, has brought you to, and then you re need divine revelation. You need prophet prophecy, which is where God sort of touches you with that spark. And that's what's being, that's what's being uh, described over here, just like in any prophetic experience. This was sui generis, this was unique, in the sense that no other prophet ever apprehended God in the way that Moshe did. And this is sort of a description of the way that God revealed himself to Moshe. But at the same time, it's, it's similar to other prophetic experiences where you work and work and work, and then you are endowed with something. 
Okay? All right. Let's hold it here for today. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.